Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 10, uh, as, you know, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Go to verse 11. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, so what happened here is that they never received the package God brought through Jesus. So they never received grace. Are we together? But verse 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them uh, he gave the right or the power to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. So when we believe in his name, then he gives us the power to become, praise God, to become children of God, to become sons of God, to become anything. Anything we're going to become is because of what heaven has done, released it through Jesus, and whatever heaven has released, if it's going to benefit our lives, we need to receive. Are we together? And the most amazing thing is that God has packaged his grace uh, of Christ, which is Christ, in human vessels, in individuals. Praise God. And Paul gives us a link. Paul gives us a link. Uh, this, this chapter 1, go down to verse 16. Thank you, Jesus. And of his fullness, we have received, we have all received, and grace for grace. God is so full, he is so loaded. Whatever he has, we can receive. Of that fullness, we can receive. Praise God. And what we receive from him can be just called grace. If we are healed, we are healed by his grace. If we are saved, we are saved by his grace. If we receive anything material, physical, we receive by his grace. Are we together? We don't receive because we are good. We receive by his grace and his willing. So, because God is full of everything we need, how do we tap into that? How do we tap into that? Now, how do we tap into that? Praise God. I'm just trying to uh, introduce by expanding our capacity to see the bigger picture so that I can make the point. Then grace then can be multiplied. Amen? Because if God is having all this grace, Jesus came with grace and truth, while Moses came with the law, but Jesus came with grace and truth. How do we receive from Jesus? How do we access what he has? How do we receive what he, 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 he carries? How do we access this fullness of Christ? Amen? Uh, and that's very, very critical. Because he is full, we must find ways in which we can receive. Now, uh, read with me uh, Philippians 1 and verse... Uh, seven is something we should read really from verse 3 but Philippians 1 verse 7 just as is right for me Paul says to think this of you all because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel you all are partakers with me of grace now this is interesting Paul is saying Whatever God is released to the church in Philippians, uh, I mean, is released in my life as Paul, the apostle, because I'm about to tell you, we need to identify those who carry the grace of Christ. The ascension gifts, the fivefold ministry, are referred to as carriers of grace. And Paul is telling the church here, I know the context in Philippians is, the Philippian church was supporting Paul financially. They were sending a lot of financial support. So he wrote this letter in prison to thank them for their participation. So in this participation, he uses a very amazing phrase. He's saying, you Philippians, you became partakers with me of grace. That's amazing. So we must learn how to interact with the grace of God and with grace carriers. Are we together? So, um, so I began showing you there are five ways we've just tried to craft together ways in which the church and God's people can access grace that is resident in a man. Are we together? Uh, let me say something radical. 
something interesting to think about. Are you ready for this one? When I was young, a young preacher, we used to say, fasten your seat belt because what I'm, we are about to take off. But now that I'm older, I don't make those jokes, although I've already made. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, we, we thank God for all the wonderful Bible schools that we, we have in the nation. In fact, this church is, begin, is beginning a, a bachelor's class today. Today, today. So we're doing uh, an evening class, you know, beginning a class today. But those uh, teachings are good, and, uh, but there's something you need together with them. You need to access anointing. So this was a statement. Bible schools are good, but they don't manufacture men and women of God. They only help align and clarify and lay foundation. But grace for ministry comes from another career of grace. Are we together? For instance, if you were to receive what Rain and Bonke carried, because he carried something heavy, Rain and Bonke, na hii generation najue na wajua. Juzi, we're asking young people, do you know Rain and Bonke? They don't know him. How would we really receive what he carried? We have to follow him everywhere he's going. We have to listen to everything he's teaching. We have to find a way in which he can lay hands on us. If we find a little offering, we send it to him. In other words, we have to align ourselves in his world so that whatever he carries in his world, at least Are we together? So, the first way, okay, first of all, we agree you can be a carrier of, you can be a participant with grace. You can link up with anybody who carries grace. Philippians did that. Are we together? And uh, I know I'm not doing justice to this verse because uh, we're we just picking it up in the middle, but uh, go, go to chapter 4, verse 15, to see how they participated in this grace and then the proclamation he made to them and how that became a blessing. Uh, now you, Philippians, Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. That's a serious statement. I don't know what was going on with these churches. They were not doing very well, but Philippians is the only church that shared with Paul in giving and receiving. And by the way, that gives us something else interesting in this introduction. By the way, you know, sometimes introduction is better than the main message. Okay, so we are still in the introduction. Ministry of giving is never called giving. It's called giving and receiving. So if you are a giver, you are permitted to receive. Say my man, you are, you are, you are a man in your idea. And if you are a giver, you are also permitted to, to receive. I know a lot, we preach a lot on sowing, sowing, sowing. Have you heard about sowing? We now need to preach. Reaping, reaping. The season of reaping is here. Reap now. You know, we need to add that for balance. Are we together? Because farmers don't sow the whole year from January to December. How many of you know there's a time they go to harvest? May that season come for you in Jesus' name. So you Philippians, you're the only church who shared with me in this matter. So when you remember in chapter 1 verse 7 that you became partakers with me of grace. Now you can see how they participated in that grace. Are we together? And we'll come to that later. But verse 16, let's follow it. Verse 16. For even in the Salonica, you sent eight ones, and again, for my necessities. That's good. 17. Not that I seek the gift, but, I, but the fruit that abounds to your account. I think this is good. If you are teaching on giving, this is a good verse. That uh, the purpose of Thanking you for your giving is not because you are looking for what you are giving. It is actually your account you are building through giving. You, you needed to locate a man who carries grace and drop your giving there so that you can build your own account. Okay, let me, let me say that until you get it. For your spiritual account and your financial account to build, look for somebody to give. Are we together? So that kind of giving is not necessary that is for the man of God. 
and he better have wisdom on how to deal with it. It's up to him if he messes with it because he will have his own judgment. Tuko pamoja. Ye man of God, if he doesn't know how to handle the money, he will have his own judgment. Now, we pray that God will help those people like Paul to know how to handle and to administer the gift. Over the week, I was here in this treatment. I went to Meru last week. We were visiting seven churches in two days. We drove many kilometers, you know, just go a few minutes, meet the pastor, his wife, and one or two of his co-elders, see what they are doing, encourage them, pray for them, prophesy to them, tell them, keep on doing the work of God. And even if you're going through trouble, don't worry, through these troubles, we shall still enter in the kingdom. You know, we did that, seven churches. It was amazing, a very long trip from place to place. And we kept doing that. And now I don't know why I'm telling you that story. But, you know, uh, it's, it's good for people to know that when you give, it is your county, your building. Your build, it's good for you. It's good for you. It's good for you. Amen. It's also good for me. I also must look for a career of grace. So what I did a while ago, uh, I opened a special account where I put some my, my, my own tithe and my own whatever. Then I pick it, boom, and I put it in the hands of my spiritual authority to build my own account in the spirit. Because I also must be a practitioner of the things we talk about. I know most pastors tithe to themselves because uh, they surrendered their lives to Jesus, so they declare themselves tithe. Like in the Tutaonana Kwai conference, Tutaonana. Sorry, I mean, we will we, we clarify that. Praise God. Look at verse 18. I'm just trying to clarify this point. I'm talking too much, but anyway, you will get the point. Will you get to the point? Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. I hope pastors can say that. I am full. Uh, having received from Ephaphroditus the things you sent uh, things sent from you now look at how your offering is referred to a sweet smelling aroma an acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to God I like that may you also you as also be given that description those three three descriptions praise God then verse 19 is the mega one that people misuse this one is not for everybody. Tell your neighbor, this one is not for you if you're not giving. And my God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's saying, my God. Paul is referring to my God. What is that, my God? The phrase there, my God, is referring to his anointing. The grace in his life. He's saying the grace that is resident in me as Paul shall trigger a move of God to you, the giver. Did you get it? Then my God shall supply to you. Hey. So if you are not a giver, don't wake up and encourage yourself with this verse. You'll just be telling the ceiling. So this kind of verse requires you escorted with some, some giving. Am I talking too much? Yeah, okay. So, ways in which we access grace. Because we I was just trying to show you that this grace from God is not in the air. It's carried in vessels, other vessels. is carried by men and women. You also carry grace. Are we together? But there are levels of grace. The ascension gifts, the fivefold ministries, are graces. And we showed you that in scripture. But for the sake of visitors, go to Ephesians 4 verse uh, 7, and then we'll go to 11. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. He measures out this grace to his people, praise God. And he has also measured something for you. But as we follow this, all the way, verse 11, and he gave some because uh, he resurrected, he rose from the dead, and he gave gifts unto men. But here the Bible says, and he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so these five are graces of Christ. You know, Christ shared himself in five ways. Glory to God. 
I'll be teaching on the Wednesdays uh, in the coming few weeks, actually from this Wednesday in the school ministry about the fivefold ministry. I'll teach on who are apostles, who are prophets. I'll take a series and it will help the believers to know what Jesus has done. Are we together? Now, so how can you receive <clears throat> these graces that have been given to uh, these ascension gifts so that the church and believers can, can grow fat in the spirit? The anointing can increase in their life. Glory to God. Because when the anointing grows in your life, then it will break yokes. Are you listening? When you become maturer in the spirit, there are certain things that will just autocorrect and others will just go. The more you know Christ, the more your life will enter into a place of ease. Certain things will not trouble you because grace is multiplying in your life. Are we together? One of the ways we mentioned was I said benedictions and proclamations, apostolic proclamations, declarations, and benedictions. When men of God declare something, then grace is released. And as I'm saying that, you know, the Holy Spirit just quickly, you know, spoke to me there and gave me the scripture in Isaiah 55, you know, and verse 10 uh, and uh, 11, Isaiah 55. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to this one, bread to the eater. Rain coming down. Somebody say rain coming down. So verse 11. Uh, so shall my word that goes out of my mouth. So when the preceding word, when the word leaves the mouth of a grace carrier and is declared and proclaimed, that word will come like rain. When it finds a ground and it hits the ground, the Bible says, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. It's a blessing that we came to Nairobi, ladies and gentlemen, just to speak words and bless the people of the city. Just proclaim and pronounce, then you get it, you receive it, you believe it, it begins to work for you. And that word will never return void. Glory to God. God's word when it's spoken, it will never return void. Hallelujah. And one of the things I began proclaiming this week is that believers in the marketplace will win the spiritual battles in the marketplace. It's something I began teaching yesterday. Uh, you wait for it. It will also spill over into the lunch hour. The believers will win the spiritual battles in the office, in the marketplace. You will win that battle. And we need to teach you how to win that battle. You will have rest in your office. You will have rest in the business and among your workers. And the people you work with and your colleagues, the peace and the grace of God will abound. Praise God. And we are teaching believers now how to overcome warfare that comes through thoughts. And words and things that people speak is another amazing area, praise God. But I want you to know when we make proclamations and we make announcements, glory to God, something happens and people receive grace. Thank you, Jesus. Secondly, we said last time, when you enter into a covenantal relationship with a spiritual father, when you enter into a connection, a relationship, you are in the same sphere, the same realm. You walk in the realm and areas of your father, spiritual father. And I took time just to clarify that spiritual fathering is real, is part of Christ's doctrine. I know we have a young generation in the nation that is writing on Facebook everywhere and saying spiritual father, fathering is fake in this uh, spiritual fathering, you know, matter that it is fake. I saw yesterday when people are congratulating their fathers everywhere, a few said this is idolatry, but I'm wondering, do they have a father at home? Did they impersa the father in the village and tell him, daddy, isiku, niasiku kama nyinyi, na nimekutumia yo 1000, ujimudu. Did they do that? Were they worshipping the father? A simple honor. Come on. A simple what? Honor. Glory to God. And so, spiritual fathering is a doctrine which is part of the scripture and we clarified that and those probably who are tuning in and they are wondering you can look into scripture uh, I mean not in scripture but in the last messages we did praise God a spiritual father is one you can touch one you can greet one you can come into his fear physically and it will be a blessing Ruth and Naomi was a connection that changed Ruth's destiny when you remember that story don't you the book of Ruth she, Naomi went to, uh, you know, Moab, 
with her husband. She lost the husband. The two sons married two women there, Ofra and Ruth. And then those two sons died. I think that was a long location. If the location where you are, things are dying, you need to move. Did you hear what I said? If where you are, things are just dying and collapsing, and you look like, it looks like this is Moab, please go back home. Go to Bethlehem, Judah. Your fortunes will return. Glory to God. And do you remember the two women were given opportunity by Naomi? You go back because, Lily, I can't get more sons. You go back. And offer, whose name means to show and to give the back, you know, she gave Naomi the back, and she went back to Moab. Ruth, whose name means friendship, she's stuck. I'm going to be your friend, Naomi, no matter what. Do you see the two women coming back home? Ruth is a stranger, but Naomi is coming back home. And guess what? Ruth is attached to Naomi, and I tell you, her future is secure. You need to find a Naomi. Because Naomi is a picture of a spiritual father, a carrier of grace. When you walk with him or walk with her, glory to God. And listen, these things have no gender. Spiritual fathering has no gender. Okay, let me post there because anyway, we can't teach everything of a lunch hour. But let me say this. Can a woman be an apostle? Oh, I like you Kenyans, you are saying so quickly. Pandey, I don't know you met about it. Like any... Uh, can, it's like asking, can a woman be a pastor? There's no male or female in Christ. Are we together? Pastor, apostle, preacher, whatever, is a position in the spirit, and anybody can fit in that position. In fact, the Ephesians 4.11, when the Bible says he gave some to be, the word some in the Greek is both masculine and feminine, meaning any of the two can fit in. Thank you, Jesus. Are we together? Again, we also know, not every man is a, is a preacher. Some men don't preach. They, they are not gifted in that area. So you can't say that that position is for a man because not every man can preach. So there's a huge doctrine. Anyway, there are certain churches, there are certain teachings that women should not come anywhere near the pulpit. And uh, if you have heard it, you need to also find the proper answer to that question they keep on asking. But the problem with it is there's a religious spirit behind it. But may that spirit... You know, religion is always against women. Study every religion. You'll see there's a problem. Even Judaism. Women should stay in the outer court. They should not come anywhere close. It's only for the priest to come in. But thank God for Jesus. He came to give liberty and freedom. And he doesn't give two-thirds. Jesus gives 100%. Hallelujah. He doesn't give you 50%. He gives you everything. So, Naomi is a picture of a spiritual father. Ruth is a picture of somebody who comes into divine relational connection with a carrier of grace. And Ruth showed up in that lineage of Jesus today. Hallelujah. So, relationships and connections that we come into are divine. And I want to challenge you prophetically. Uh, evaluate the relationships you have. See those that are godly and those that are not godly kick those out. God is a God who gives us proper connections and relationships. Amen. And if in, in case you are lonely, in case you don't know, you know, you're just alone, you're probably you have a heart disease. Let me say this in this way. Maybe you have a heart disease. You are unable to really keep relationships. Every two, the last five years, you have had five pastors. You are sick and you need help. And that sickness is called, it's an orphan spirit. Orphan spirit. Inability to keep relationships. Inability to pursue. Inability to trust. These are some of the marks of an orphan spirit. Inability to trust others. Inability to submit. Inability to fully give up. Give your life to other people. Inability to walk with them. Uh, you find every time you draw near, after a moment, if there's a little problem, just a little problem, you call the police, you know, just a little problem, you, you withdraw, it's a manifestation of an orphan spirit. But you can be healed so that you learn how to walk with others. In Psalm 68, verse 6 says, he sets, let's wait for it so that you can see it. Because sometimes when you see the verse, you can remember it and it can be a blessing. God sets the solitary, the lonely. Where does he put them? In families, and he brings out those who are bound. Where does he take them? 
into prosperity. But the rebellious, what happens with them? You don't want to join the company of those who are dwelling in the wilderness, in a parched ground, in a dry ground, in the, in the desert. You don't want to be that kind of person who is rebellious. Rather be somebody who can fit in a family and you no longer be lonely. I encourage every preacher to walk with other preachers. Don't, don't listen to the older generation who said big elephants walk alone. So the, the, the greater you become in anointing, the more you should be alone. I don't encourage that. I know that the, the, there's a level you can come in and some will just fall by the wayside. But even then, you still should have some people who are walking with you and you are walking with them. And it will be a blessing. Praise God. So this way you receive grace. But entering into these relationships, uh, Cornelius uh, needed Peter to come to the open door of grace. Do you know Cornelius? There was a man in Acts 10. This guy was a great giver. This guy is a great, was a great prayer. The Bible says his prayers and givings came to God as a memorial. And God looked at that man and said, surely this man, if he doesn't get saved, Surely, he will miss out on the grace of God. So, you know what God did? He talked to Peter, who had gone for lunch, in the house of Simon the Tanner. And Peter was praying at the rooftop as he was waiting for lunch. And I've said it before, that's a better way to wait for lunch. By staying on the rooftop praying, you are here waiting for lunch. Glory to God. In the presence of God. And then the Holy Spirit came to Peter and showed him a vision. He showed him uh, a sheet of hair in four corners. And, uh, you know... And clean animals, four-footed beasts there. And he was told, arise, kill and eat. He said, I can't eat something unclean. He was told second time, arise and eat. He said, I can't eat anything unclean. The third time, arise and eat. And then he discovered, oh, oh, there is a problem here. Or there is a message here. And while wondering, what does this mean? Three men have already knocked the gate of, Cor uh, uh, of that house of Simon. And they have been sent by Cornelius. Because Cornelius also had another encounter. He had been told, send for Peter. See how God is making connection for Cornelius with a senior apostle called Peter. These divine connections is so that we can access grace. And I pray for you that God will also give you a divine connection so that you can access grace that you did not have before. Because Peter surely represents carrying such grace. And Cornelius was in need. And the two men finally met. Peter agreed to go with a little team to Cornelius' house. And the Bible says he began to speak. He began to speak in Cornelius' house. Verse 34 of Acts chapter 10 and 35. And Peter said, now I know or I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in a man, in any nation who fears God, and works righteousness is acceptable unto him. And as Peter was preaching, Cornelius is listening. Peter is having some Jews. Look, Gentiles and Jews are in one house. For the first time in the New Testament. Do you remember the Samaritan woman, how she protested? Jews and, I mean, Samaritans and Jews have no dealings. But now, the Holy Ghost has been poured. Now all nations are coming in. And Cornelius in the Gentile world must come in. Peter is the vessel God has sent. Although Peter brought a lot of problems, he kept refusing and he kept mishandling circumcision. Later, God shifted that minister of Peter to Paul. He had to save a terrorist called Paul and bring him to salvation so that he can minister to the Gentiles. Peter was the one who was given the opportunity, but he mishandled it. When you mishandle grace and mishandle callings and mishandle what God is giving you, he will give it to somebody else. God is never short of options. Okay, sasa nimekuja sana, nimekuja sana. But hiyo ni ukweli. Please handle what I was hearing over the weekend. And this is the reason I gave you the story of Meru uh, and I did not finish. I was hearing this statement, so I'm still thinking about it. And I'm searching in scripture. That the church must administrate the gifts of God. How do you administrate the gift of God? So I'm still meditating on that. Because God has given us a lot of stuff. And how do we administrate that? Because if we don't properly administrate the gifts of God, we either misuse them or miss them and never access full grace. Now we can pray and let you go. And then we can gather tomorrow by the grace of God. Amen? But by this covenantal relationship, so I will ensure tomorrow we move it first and show you these, all these ways in which you can access grace 
my goal and the goal of the Spirit is that grace and peace be multiplied to you. Ijumuisha marakada, glory to God, so that your life can explode in the Spirit. So that every time there's something good want to release to you, he will quickly send help your way. And your attitude of receiving grace carriers will be a good attitude. And if you are wounded and hurting, God will heal you quickly. And he will say, surely that one was a crook, but at least there's another one who is not a crook. Stand up on your feet.